and you're the host. Okay, let's get started. Uh, good evening, everyone uh, who have joined us from India, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone who has joined us from the other parts of the world. Welcome to this special edition of Masterclass, a signature event of Robert H. Smith School of Business, University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded, and uh, I would like to uh, put up a request that all your questions uh, just put it up in the Q and A section, and we'll take some of them after the speaker's presentation. I would like to extend a specially warm welcome to our featured guest and a speaker, uh, Mr. Saurav Mukherjee, founder and chief investment officer of Marcellus Investment Managers, and to managing director of Smith School India Operations, Mr. Manish Bansal. I am Shubhki Tisena, Assistant Director in Recruitment of Collaboration at the Smith School. Today's uh, featured speaker, Mr. Mukherjee, is a renowned investment and fund manager who has mastered the science and art of investing. Uh, he is an alum of London Business School and a former CEO of Ambit Capital. He was rated as the leading equity strategist in 2015, 16, and 17 by Asia Money Polls. Mr. Mukherjee is also the author of four best-selling books, the latest one being The Victory Project, uh, Six Steps to Potential, uh, that you can check out on Amazon. He is, he's a bestseller, and he's also a fellow at the Royal Society of Arts. Today, he is here to share his views on how to think like a monopolist and execute like one. So without further ado, uh, I would just like to hand it over to Saurav uh, to do it with his presentation, and then we'll take up a few questions at the end. Thank you, Saurav. Enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Shukriti. Thank you to the University of Maryland as well. Uh, so folks, I'll use a set of slides, but I was just having a look at uh, other people who are uh, attending the session. I know there are several familiar faces here. So for some people, this might be a repetition, in which case I apologize. The thing is, I've only had two good, two good ideas in my whole life, and I've written two good books on the back of it. Uh, as a result, I end up repeating myself. Uh, most places I talk to, but I'll try try my best to 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 sort of uh, use different examples compared to what you might have heard in the past. So let me just put this in show mode, uh, and uh, one second, let me just put this in show mode, and and then we'll we'll be on our way. Uh, so one of the challenges with Zoom is the show mode button gets covered. Uh, one second, let me try to put this in show mode. So, so the, the topic I'm going to talk about is is one that you know many of you would be familiar with, which is uh, uh, how how is it that our country has become the most monopolized large economy in the world? I'll give you some stats to show that. Uh, and let me just do one last try to see if I can get this thing into show mode. Uh, and... Right, so hopefully you can see that. Let me. Sarab, you have to press slideshow on top. Slideshow and from the right, beginning. From, Let's slide. Slide. Yeah, from the beginning or from current slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Very kind. So, uh, so, so the the stat, the data that we collected, uh, we first collected this data on the left hand side of the screen. We first collected it three years ago. We've been updating it each year and. Earlier this year, The Economist magazine in the UK uh, asked us to do a special piece for them, which is where I've taken this slide from, the, the chart from. Basically, if you look at our country, right, we've now created an economy. We've created an economy where the 20 largest companies account for nearly 70% of the nation's profits, right? And it's worth just looking at this chart and seeing how our, how our economy has evolved since liberalization. So when, when the country was opened up in 1991-92, the top 20 companies of that era. So the top 20 companies on the BSC in 91, 92 was Hindustan Motors, uh, Premier Padmini, uh, Mafat Lal, Century Textiles. These sorts of firms accounted for around 15% of the nation's profits in, in that era, 1-5%. Even if you look at, say, 2010 on the chart on the left, even in 2010, the top 20 uh, companies accounted for a mere 30%. Of the country. But by the way, in America today, in America today, the top 20 companies account for around 30-35% of America's profits, right? And then in the last 10 years, you can see in that you see in that chart on the left, just see the blue line rockets up, it almost goes vertical. So in FI 19, in FI 19, the top 20 companies accounted for 62%. In FI 20, 
they accounted for 70%, right? The FI20 data is not on this slide, but FI20, the top 20 companies accounted for 70%. And I suspect when the results for this COVID impacted year come out, I suspect the top 20 companies this year will account for 80, 85% of the of the country's profits. Obviously, this is a, 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 a this is a skewed year, but uh, but it sort of serves to illustrate the point that over the last 10 years, the strong have got stronger. Now, why has this happened? Why are why is our country uh, at one level so blessed to have around 20 giant companies who take home 70, 80 percent of the nation's profits? Right. One part of the answer is on the side, on the right hand side. Right. You see our country. Hello. A country is unique in that. A country is unique in that. Uh, uh, if you see the Indian economy, it's unique in that in every sector, one or two companies take home around 85 percent, 80, 85 percent of the of the sector's profits. I've given you several examples on the screen on the right hand side. Um, I could give you, a, you know, another list of another 10, 15 companies who are like this. Um, uh, the, the, the data that we get, the, the data on the left shows that we are the most monopolized large economy in the world. And in a way, the data on the right illustrates why. But there's another way to understand the situation and we'll move forward to understand that. So if I take uh, the 13 monopolists who are part of our flagship portfolio, we've got We've got three different portfolios in the firm, but the flagship portfolio, the consistent compounder portfolio has 13 stocks. What we've seen over the last, whether it's the last year, FI20, I'm looking at the right hand side of this chart, right hand side of this slide. Whether I take the last year, FI20, the last three years, the last five years, what you tend to see in India is that the typical Indian monopolist grows the grows his or her business by by 20%. The typical Indian monopolist grows profits by 20%, grows capital employed by 20%. The whole scale of the operation grows incrementally at 20% a year. That's the right hand side of the slide. And the result of that is the left hand side of the slide. The left hand side of the slide is, is showing that uh, earnings come, the share price compounding is also 20%, right? So whether we take the last three years or the last five years, uh, the Indian monopolist share prices compound at 20%. Clearly, the Nifty doesn't do that. Uh, the Nifty neither compounds earnings nor share price at 20%. The BSE 500 doesn't do that. And, and interestingly, if you go to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, add up the profits of the top 20,000 Indian companies, 6,000 listed, 14,000 unlisted, over the last decade, the top 20,000 Indian companies uh, profits, excluding the top 20 monopolists, have grown at 1% per annum. So in the same country where GDP growth is 6%, nominal GDP growth is around 10%, the top 20 monopolists grow their profits at 20%. Everybody else that you and I know grows their profits at, at 1% per annum. Right. So there's clearly a big difference between the monopolist and everybody else in the same country that others are growing at 1%, the monopolist grows at 20%. So how, how can you, I... Uh, how can uh, we become monopolist? How can we think like monopolists, right? Now, the whilst we have written books on India, one book which really set us thinking about this whole subject uh, five, six years ago was Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, right? So so I'll, I'll give you some of the ideas from the book, but if you really want to, and if you're really interested in this subject and you love thinking and building monopolies, then the video on the bottom of the slide is a must watch. So it's basically the Zero to One book turned into a, one hour video and it's easy to watch just go to youtube and you can watch it there uh, on youtube the title of the video is competition is for losers right and you can understand why competition is for losers as per peter thiel because he's saying that look uh, 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 all failed companies and 99.9 percent .9 of companies have failed in the thiel construct because these companies have failed to escape competition his point is that the central purpose of building a business is to beat the competition and build a monopoly if you're just going to compete to you know what's the fun in that? You'll never make a return on capital above cost of capital, and you know it's like a it's like a pretty miserable existence. Now, how do you then build a monopoly? I'll give you the Thiel recipe as he's articulated it. Then I'll give you the Indian promoter recipe. The Indian promoter recipe, thoda sa different hai. Thiel and the Indian promoter are slightly different. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah, so so, so the Indian the Indian uh, uh, promoter's recipe is slightly different from Thiel, but let me first discuss Thiel, then I'll come down to the the Indian promoter. Um, what Thiel is saying is the classical construct he believes to build a monopoly is 
identify a unserved market narrow unserved market in plain english identify a niche identify a niche that others can't see enter the niche and then build entry barriers around it right entry barriers around colonize the niche monopolize the niche right and and he cites as an example amazon so so if you read uh, jeff bezos ka the everything store he famously describes there that 95 i think 95 equid d show in new york and drove across the country to seattle where with some angel funding he set up the amazon books business why did bezos start with the books business because he looked at the conventional bookstore model in america and realized that the conventional bookstore model was flawed it was flawed because the conventional bookstore in america uh, can only carry say 10000 books and at any given point in time the us market is buying 10x as many books right this 10x thing will come back it's very interesting 10x this is the this is the this is the famous thiel power law so he said look i can do something which is 10x better i can have a bookshop which will have 10x as many books as barnes and noble and you won't have to you know drive in your car to the supermarket or the local shopping strip you can just sit at home and buy 10 times as many books as a typical barnes and noble can can sell to you so with angel funding he built the amazon books business that was his first monopoly then he moved in concentric circles outwards we'll come back to this concept again concentric circles outwards after books he went after cds right same construct so when i was a teenager in the uk we used to go to the local cd store hmv ka cd store hota tha obviously the local cd store contained at most 2000 cds whereas the market itself was 10 times larger so these was first wrecked the books industry by bringing amazon into the picture books then he went after the music industry right in my in my own lifetime i've seen uh, the famous record shops in london and new york disappear courtesy amazons amazon's uh, monopolization after that he moved to broader us retail so books cds broader us retail after broader us retail done he moved to european retail uske baad asian retail right concentric circles right and another man who's done the same formula is a peter friend of peter thiel in fact co-founder with peter thiel in paypal uh, 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 elon musk and tesla right so tesla did not start did not start with the with the the family sedan right they didn't start with the sedan they started with a niche model the 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 roadster niche sports car 110000 dollar ticket uh, clearly focusing on a niche market once they nailed the sports car market then they moved to the 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 model less the sedan uh, uh, which is now their best selling model and again it's the same construct monopolize a niche chota sa market then you move in concentric circles outward so so why does thiel recommend this uh, modus operandi this uh, standard operating procedure his point is that if you first start with a narrow niche market you need less cash right not only do you need less money you can also try out various things you're still building your team you're trying out various team members uh, you're try, try, testing out your technology your business processes and all of this you can do in a lower risk lower cost environment lower cash burn environment by focusing on a niche so in a way uh, niches are where monopolists are kind of born right niches are where monopolists are born they perfect their ideas their processes their team their uh, uh, basically uh, working capital cycle and then once they're fully muscled up they they move outwards in concentric circles right and 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 um, one of the key things he emphasizes is that there's nothing called first mover advantage right that's for a that's a lallu concept right the relevant concept is uh, building up your your barriers to entry building up your business processes and if anything there's a last mover advantage right and in a lot of what thiel says right you will see across the world including our country a lot of business people don't follow this now let's move to indian monopolies right they obviously weren't waiting for thiel to come along uh, 40 years before peter thiel came along indian monopolies figured out how to build their own version of of monopolies so how does the desi monopolies do it the desi monopolies does a slight variant on thiel it's not so much niche they do sometimes target niches what they do is they attack the most challenging aspect of the sector right so if they are setting up an nbfc they won't just be doing the same straightforward nbfc they will moat the nbfc they'll attack the nbfc business problem in a way nobody else has thought of they will deliberately do it in a way which is hard to replicate right once they have built the initial moat they'll keep adding they'll keep adding layers of difficulty to it so that nobody else can compete with them right and you know uh, if you read my books there are several examples given i'll just in the interest of time i'll just cite one example 
which is Asian paints, right? So, so Asian paints is a classic uh, 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 replication of this flow chart that I put in front of you. So, back in the 60s, uh, ICI, now Exxon Noble, Uzzamarek ICI, used to rule the roost. Their, their product was Dulux. Still, even to this day, Dulux is the best paint available in the Indian market. And Asian paints realized that they could not compete with Dulux on quality. The obvious area that, that everybody says is let me produce a really high quality product and that'll be my mode. That's not a clever idea. Right? So, so, so Asian paints realized that on chemistry, they couldn't could not compete with with the with the British guys. So they targeted the distribution construct and they specifically said we will focus on building barriers to entry around distribution using technology. And thus came the famous purchase in 1970 by Lal Choksi of India's first supercomputer when he spent eight crore rupees, which in 1970 was a fortune to build in, to buy India's first supercomputer and he put in place the, the distribution mode which still makes Asian paints an invincible money machine, right? Uh, one of the greatest compounders in the planet in the last 40 years built around a technology mode. But that's not enough. As, as the distribution mode of Asian paints gathered steam through the 70s and 80s, right? their cash flow, their, their return on equity far exceeded, the return on capital employed, the return on equity far exceeded that of competition. Competition, Free cash flow is nothing other than return on capital minus cost of capital. So through the 80s, Asian paints found that it was generating way more cash than the competition was. So they've used that to make it even harder for other other companies to compete with them. So uh, an example of how they made it even harder, and in fact, it happens every year now. So now that I've figured out the paradigm in Marcellus, we keep seeing every year how Asian paints makes it harder and harder and harder for people to compete with them. So for example, in 1995, they increased the SKUs in the paint industry by a factor of 50. Right. So they figured out that others were figuring out the distribution construct in specific Berger. Uh, to this day, Berger is the only credible competitor they, they, they really have. Berger was figuring out the Asian Paints car data driven distribution mode. So Asian Paints said, I will step on it and I'll increase the level of difficulty by increasing the SKU. So I'll have, you know, uh, uh, SK uh, paints which are waterproof, paints which are disinfectant wala paints, paints which are sunlight resistant, paints which are rain resistant, etc. etc. Et and deliberately juice up the number of SKUs in the industry so that it becomes even harder for competition to keep up with me. Because I have technology, I can deal with more SKUs easier, others can't. And you might have seen in the last uh, four months, the next leg of making it difficult, Asian paints has said, that uh, they bought a they bought an interior decoration business, so they're form they're going to formalize the interior decoration industry. So rather than you know, typically people like me, uh, uh, rather my my wife calls other interior decorators who are chota chota mom and pop businesses. Asian Paints is, is going to formalize the interior decoration business. Why do they want to formalize the interior decoration business? You can guess it, right? Once they become the monopoly provider of interior decoration, the entire house, not just paint, floor, tiling, toilet, kitchen, sub kuch is in Asian paints is control, right? That's how a great monopolist thinks. Keep adding layers of difficulty, keep slamming the competition year after year, and you continue compounding great wealth, right? Now, if you are to take the best from the East and the West and create a recipe, uh, learning from Thiel, learning from uh, uh, the great Indian promoters that we have covered in Unusual Billionaires, if you had to create a recipe of seven things that great promoters do, I would say right at the top is what I call the secret, right? Every great monopoly has at its core a secret. So in some cases, the secret is well known in the sense that, you know, all of us know that Coca monopoly is predicated on a on a recipe, on a syrup uh, that, but that only they know it sits in some vault in Atlanta. And if you and I knew, knew the syrup, we would, uh, the, the formula the recipe of the syrup, we would be able to produce Coke, but unfortunately we don't, and that's the Coke monopoly, right? Similarly, we know that in Google's case, there is a search engine algo that only they have, which makes them a great search engine that others cannot copy, etc. Right? Uh, but in a very similar way, at the heart of Asian Paints or Davies Lab or Nestle or, or Dr. Lal Path Labs, there's a secret. The promoter is not going to come on uh, a TV or you know give a press conference saying, you know, I'm going to tell you the secret. Why should he? He's worked his entire life to figure out the secret. But it's incumbent on investors, analysts to figure this out. If you don't figure it out, you might as well forget about investing in these companies. Right. So that's the first leg is the secret. The second is the translation of that secret into a business process, into a technology which allows the monopolist to work 10x better 
than the rival. This is the famous Thiel power law that the then between the number one and the number two, if the number one is a genuinely a monopolist, he'll be doing something critical to the success of that product, which is 10x better. So, for example, in the case of a uh, uh, Devi's lab, in the case of Devi's lab, their error rate and their the flaw rate and their API is one tenth that of the the competition, right? So. Uh, uh, Devi's lab produces nearly three quarters of the world's painkiller API. One of the reasons the world's largest pharma companies order from Devi's lab, they get their API from Devi's lab, not from uh, Joshmo down the road, even though Joshmo is cheaper down the road, because Devi's lab ka error rate is one in a million. Other Indian API manufacturer is more like one in 10,000, right? Similarly, if you take, uh, say, Dr. Lal Path Labs, right, we've been we've, we've sort of uh, drilled deep into the company a couple of years ago and we realized that the whole process of doing a blood test, right, the ingredients, the testing, uh, by by generating scale efficiencies in procurement and by building a very clever uh, hub and spoke network, which again is driven by big data, they're basically able to get the job done at around one eighth the cost of the competition, right? As a result, it's simply it's a no comp no competition industry. Dr. Lal Path Labs does the same job, blood test, urine test, whatever it is, one eighth cheaper than the competition, right? Third leg is getting the timing right. So you or I as a monopolist, you might have a great secret. We might have turned it into a superb business process, a technology that nobody else has. But if we haven't timed it, if we haven't gauged whether the market has adequate demand for that, then unfortunately, our efforts might not bear fruit. And an example of this is, a, is the Tata Nano. Right? It's difficult to argue that Tata Nano as a product uh, 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 you know, was a bad product, right? It's, it's a fuel efficient car. These, you know, we haven't, it didn't really break down that much. It was a decent product, but my reckoning is it was a decade too early. Uh, uh, and it was actually quite a shame that it fizzled out because clearly there's, there was and remains a market for a fuel efficient, a uh, small car in the Indian market, right? Then we come to point four, which we've discussed before, capture a, capture a niche market and then then move in concentric circles outwards. So Peter Light is a super example. 1970 to 2000, they monopolized the heavy wall industry, adhesives industry. 2000, they entered the waterproofing industry through two acquisitions, MC and Dr. Fix It. Uh, the next 20 years, 2000 to 2020, they monopolized the the waterproofing industry, right? So both in adhesives and in waterproofing, we delight accounts for 90% of the profits generated in these sectors. And over the last couple of years, they've started building monopoly number three, which is uh, specialist flooring, tiling for, say, you know, my house or for hospitals, for sports stadiums. And if you see the annual report, every three, four months, they're acquiring a company, which is either a producer of specialist flooring or an EPC contractor for the same, right? Classic monopoly paradigm, moving monopoly after monopoly. So a different way to think about it is the geographical aspect. I gave you the Amazon example of concentric circles geographically. Dr. Lal Path is doing very similar. NCR monopoly first. Uh, so, you know, fortress franchise in NCR, and then sort of move in concentric circles outwards through the northern Indian hinterland towards the Kolkata market, towards the uh, Bengal market. Same construct, but different, uh, same construct as Amazon, but applied obviously in a very different landscape. Fifth area for monopoly, uh, for, for building a monopoly, distribution and sales, right? Um, if you ask me, right, fundamentally, one of the biggest differences, I think, between building a monopoly in the West and building a monopoly in India is, in India, it's even more possible, it's even more possible for you and me to build monopolies around distribution and sales because of the messed up logistics in our country, because of the messed up logistics in our country, selling in India, selling, marketing, distribution, every facet of going to market is actually very expensive in our country. So uh, uh, a big part of success in our industry, whether it's in asset management, uh, NBFCs, is this whole distribution, selling, marketing monopoly. And HDFC asset, I would submit, I would submit to you that HDFC asset is a is a monopoly because of their distribution sales strength, right? So a lot of people mistakenly think that an asset management firm, uh, uh, you know, lives or dies by performance and alpha shalpha. Uh, uh, that is that doesn't seem to be true, right? If you look at HDFC assets uh, strength over the last twenty years, it's not it hasn't been driven on performance. It's been driven by superior franchise when it comes to distribution selling, right? It, literally, th this company outsells its competitors by a multiple of three three to one 
on a day to day basis you go to places like dhanbad asansol kolapur sholapur uh, and we speak to ifas in these places they say that the people the person who walks off the street comes and says mere ko hdfc ka fund do right you try to present performance etc they say we don't care we believe in the hdfc brand name and that's what feel bright performance i 8 8% 9% theek hai de do fund right uh, 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 that's the these aspects right uh, understanding the relevance of the product and this is where i think deepak parekh the parekh genius ne deepak parekh figured out 20 years ago that fund management in india was more about trust and brand rather than about alpha right if you would you know got a, a a fellow like me who's grown up in the west i would have said ha fund management business chalega performance pe deepak parekh you know 100x brighter than me figured out that a fund management industry is fundamentally predicated on trust faith and brand and they've done a super job there so so that's what the other things to do equally important in building a monopoly is what to avoid right and this i, I find this list even more interesting than the preceding list so one of the best ways to identify monopolies is is in what they don't do and you'll never see a great monopolist in a pricing war or a publicity war right they won't be doing ad campaigns shouting at you from the front page of newspapers they won't be doing pricing wars as soon as you see a pricing war guarantee hai ki wahan pe monopoly nahi hai pricing war is a guarantee that there is no monopoly there people are thrashing about because they have no barriers to entry they have no monopoly and you as a investor as a minority shareholder are obviously going to be at a disadvantage second thing that monopolists never do is try to be disruptive they they are they aren't in any confrontational mode they not try to screw anybody else's happiness there is the monopolist thinks that I, either i have spotted an unsolved market which i'll go and conquer there's nobody to disrupt i'm just going to conquer the market or there is a there's a market which is currently being served in a different way i have figured out through a secret through a technology a process a different way of serving the the current market right there is no question of taking on anybody there's no competition there's no dis disruption there's no confrontation and whenever you see these things right competition confrontation price wars publicity wars you know there is no monopoly involved it's just a usual day to day uh, you know a uh, 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 zero sum game where you and i won't make any money right another facet is this whole first mover fascination i've discussed before why there is no great merit in being first mover unless unless you're serving an industry with great network network economics uh, uh, where network effects are very very powerful uh, it's not obvious to me there's a first mover advantage in doing anything another very bizarre thing and this is something especially true in our country is this fascination with thinking that mbas can be monopolists mbas can be entrepreneurs right mbas are classically trained to give lots and lots of exams and fight the conventional corporate battle right there are people who are who self selected themselves as you know i'll do i'll get good marks in exams and then i'll fight for the jobs in the most prestigious firms then i'll fight for promotion they are obviously conformists they are people who linearly rise to great glory in corporate setups uh, mbas very rarely make this uh, make, make monopolist right monopolist is necessarily somebody who thinks about the world differently who is not interested in conventional paradigms who is interested in coming up with ways of doing business that others simply can't imagine and hence the, the mba and the the monopolist tends to be mutually exclusive right the 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 uh, I won't go through the whole shopping list you guys can read it one part which i found to be very revealing is bullet 6 so looking at the the promoter's compensation and their lifestyle we have found is very very revealing it's uh, I, uh, to this day to this day in my 12 years in india i haven't come, come across a monopolist uh, uh, who who uh, owns cricket teams football teams formula 1 teams uh, who shows off his wealth or her wealth or who turns up and you know with film stars and red carpet uh, you know red carpet events and so on almost all the great monopolists that we've seen in india uh that we have invested by the way one disclaimer all of these are portfolio companies of marcelus so so yes i have a vested interest in telling you this uh, we have invested in all these stocks if you want to invest in them that's your prerogative but please do your own work before you invest in these stocks don't say sir i presented maine khareed liya and then you know uh, shout that uh, 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 i miss sold you so we have invested in these stocks it's up to you whether you want to invest but one clear thing i've seen with great monopolists is they'll be immensely wealthy but they will not make a show of their wealth and i think the best example i find in in, uh, in the city i live in in mumbai is uday kotak is the world's richest banker uh, but he lives in a 
he lives a, 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 a very what should i say professional middle class lifestyle uh, he lives in a flat obviously his flat is a little bigger than my flat but he lives in a flat and i haven't seen him you know buy cricket teams or badminton teams i, I don't think he'll have any problem affording any but it, it's, it's not the sort of thing a monopolist does his mind from what i can make out is about how do i uh, uh, get a move on on the competition how do i uh, pull away even further from the competition in the banking sector and and and, and this i think is a characteristic of of monopolist their brain simply is not interested in the conventional signals of success which is you know flashing your wealth and showing off your wealth egyptian pharaoh style by building pyramids uh, 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 and and if you guys are interested in the subject the subject this is this uh, 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 there's a book by a guy called uh, rene girard french philosopher called rene girard it's it's about a subject called mimesis and what mimesis says is all of us most of us rather 99.9% of us um figure out what to do in life by copying others imitating others watching others right so uh, uh, it's called mimetic desire because i'm miming you I'm, i'm copying you so i want to have a flat in a posh area in bombay because that's the thing to do i want to send my kids to fancy universities abroad because that's what everybody does i covet a certain car or a watch or a lifestyle because that's what everybody does right and mimesis is a very common feature in human life very few very little of what most of us do myself included very little of what we do is actually original what distinguishes a monopolist at the most psychological level and this is the subject i've delved into in the victory project is the ability to break away from this type of thinking a monopolist is is able to break away from the mimetic paradigm and that's the sort of psychological aspect now let's come back to the real world and just do one example and that's stop stop yapping right sorry yeah the powerpoint is not really yeah so let's do this example then i'll stop so so this i think i find bajaj finance a picture perfect case study of how to build a monopoly in what everybody thinks is a super competitive industry how to build a monopoly from from scratch so the story began the story began 12 years ago and the story began with my first while neighbor joining uh, uh, joining uh, bajaj finance right so so uh, 2008 bajaj finance's loan book was all of uh, 2500 crores of which half was bajaj auto ka financing so it was very small loan book and rajiv jain sanjeev bajaj and the late great nanu pamnani joined forces right and they joined forces to figure out how to build a successful mbfc and right at the outset they 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 figured that that they they wanted to build a business model that nobody else could emulate nobody else could copy right so how to build a lend how to build an nbfc that others can't copy um the obvious answer moved in the direction of technology credit assessment uh, 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 credit underwriting in a way that is hard to emulate uh, now who exactly came up with this insight of this troika of of gentlemen i don't know i suspect it was danu bangani ji but i can't i can't be 100% sure but uh, our reckoning is between 2010 and 2015 bajaj finance collected at least 10 times more data on the 200 300 million most affluent people in our country than anybody else right uh, so for all of us who are on the zoom call i can confidently tell you bajaj finance knows more about all of us on this call bajaj finance knows more about us than anybody else in the country right now this is that uh, a superior collection of 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 big data uh, rajiv jain then did the analytics and he started identifying profit pools that others couldn't identify right that's the that's the skill of the monopolist right uh, you can give the same data to 25 other nbfcs they won't be able to figure out how to mine the data rajiv's team they have i think 150 uh, data analysts now but back in 2010 2011 2012 i don't think their the data analyst team was at that that large it was really a question of insight and i think the insight came from the big man so they started identifying pools of borrowers who were low risk but others couldn't spot them so the first pool they spotted was the was doctors and dentists right there there are around 10 lakh doctors and dentists in the country bajaj baf saw bajaj finance saw that these were low risk borrowers for obvious reasons right the cash flows of doctors and dentists are fairly stable um they were low risk borrowers but the banks treated them as smes and hence charged them higher rates of interest so bajaj said we will target and lend aggressively to the segment within 2 3 years they collected more data on doctors and dentists than obviously anybody else had in india and then came the second barrier to entry which is stratifying this data which is stratifying this data and 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 uh, and uh, 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 
putting it into 600 di different risk buckets. So for example, uh, uh, they said that if a doctor comes from a top 20 medical school, we will give him a superior score. And if he comes from a bottom 20 medical school, then we'll give him a lesser score. If she's an oncologist, then better score. If a, a cosmetic surgeon, then say lower score. If uh, her clinic is in Bandra, then better score. And if the clinic is say, in Sholapur, then lower score. So just to put it all together, if a doctor is from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences practicing oncology in Bandra, which I finance and you'll roll out the red carpet with the best possible rates. But uh, if if uh, uh, if he's a graduate from a uh, you know third rate medical school practicing in the middle of nowhere and you know doing cosmetic surgery, then obviously much much uh, much higher interest rates would be charged to said doctor. Now, as soon as they did it, the barrier to entry was was very formidable because now if tomorrow morning uh, Saurav Mukherjee said I also want to lend to doctors and dentists, obviously I don't have that sort of data. So what will I do? I'll, I'll offer an average interest rate. At that average interest rate. The AIMS doctor in Bandra is not going to borrow from Saurabh because I'll be too expensive for her. But the cosmetic surgeon in the middle of nowhere will borrow from Saurabh because Saurabh will be offering an attractive rate to the cosmetic surgeon. So this is called adverse selection. My entry into the doctor financing industry will, will, pull, will attract from Bajaj their highest risk customers. And my entry paradoxically will purify improve the quality of Bajaj's book, right? So in true Thiel style, they perfected their data analyst, the analytics, their uh, collection systems uh, uh, in this industry, doctors, dentists, then they moved in concentric circles outwards. Us ke baad lawyers, chartered accountants, uh, 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 architects and so on. So today they are the largest financiers. Bajaj Finance is the largest lender to the self-employed white collar uh, industry in our country, right? Uh, uh, then came the third uh, layer of the barrier to entry, which was the largest consumer durables book in the country. The, some, some in substance of what I'm trying to drive at is the reason Bajaj Finance delivers 25% ROE when no other NBFC can even cross 15, 16% is not because they take higher risk. In fact, they take less risk than any other NBFC in the country. And I'll give you two metrics to understand this. Bajaj Finance's debt equity ratio is five times, peer average is 10. Right? So with half the gearing, they have uh, ROE uses twice as large. One last uh, factoid, most NBFCs in India, actually all NBFCs in India, borrow short term, lend long term. Right? That's, this is the norm the world over. They borrow in the one year CP market and lend five year, 20 year money. Bajaj Finance borrows four year money, lends long term. So they, they do what is called reverse ALM. So with less ALM risk, with less debt equity, with the lowest NPA metrics in this industry over the last five, six years, you get the highest ROEs. And that is the secret of, of the Indian monopolist. The Indian monopolist, the unusual billionaire, uh, uh, generates the best returns with the lowest risk. And that, in a way, is the essence of, of monopolist thinking. Thinking about the industry in a completely different way and building a business process around technology, around analytics, and around genuine business insight, which nobody else has. So, so that's the that's the that's the uh, uh, roadmap that we've figured out on how to build monopolists. We have most of what I told you is in these three books that you see on the screen. If you want the global perspective on this, then these are the three best books I've seen on a global basis on how to build monopolists. Zero to one we discussed. Uh, the book on the right uh, was published uh, seven eight months ago. Uh, it's incredibly hard hitting. Right? They've really gone hammer and tongs. The book on the right, they've gone hammer and tongs at Google and Facebook and so on, which is why it hasn't been publicized widely in the media. But really well written book by Jonathan Tepper. If you want to understand how the great American monopolies have been built, so I'll stop there. Back to you, Shukriti. Happy to happy to take a few questions if people are interested in asking any. So, Kitty, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, sorry, thank you for that. Uh, that was a really power session on how to be a monopolist, how to think like one. Uh, there are a few questions that are covered in there. So, I would just direct a few questions to you. And probably, uh, Anish should also like to have a word uh, and, and some questions on this presentation. So, let's get to the first question uh, that is. From Rahul, uh, what is the shortest period that you have seen for building a monopoly and in which sector? Are there any monopolized businesses coming out in the last 10 years? 
with the advent of technology and mostly companies becoming data driven isn't that monopoly may not last long this technology thing is a complete red herring so if anybody believes that uh, technology changes the rules of the game or it creates more or less monopolies uh, that's a that's a fallacy um and uh, uh, what we are seeing in our country right i showed you that profit share wala slide you are seeing that the entire economy is folding up in the hands of 2025 families uh, uh, in front of in front of all of us on this zoom call we have seen industry side like say uh, footwear the hawaii chappal i'm wearing is from relaxo relaxo is a is a monopoly that has been built in front of us over the last uh, 20 years uh, we've seen in front of us the glass line vessels the, the, the ceramic reactor industry which uh, so glass line vessels are giant versions of this coffee cup inside which uh, pharmaceutical products chemicals are made one company controls 80% of the industry now right uh, if you haven't heard about it you'll hear about it in due course gmn fordler controls 80% of the glass line vessels so whatever the why you and i have whatever chemicals we are using 80% of it is made in uh, in vessels ceram giant ceramic vessels made by one company another monopoly which is getting built as we speak is is ethylamines ethylamines is a basic chemical which goes into uh, which goes into the pharmaceutical industry and the chemicals industry one company now controls 55% of the industry with a degree of conviction i can tell you this company will control 80% of the industry 10 years out the company is called alkyl amines so folks once again a disclaimer everything i tell you about is is companies in which we've got hundreds of crores invested right if you want to invest do your own work for christ sakes don't go and blab saurav ne bola maine kharida fir paisa nahi bana right that's the saddest thing that anybody can do please don't do it uh, uh another monopoly right uh, uh let's take talk about a world uh, world basis monopoly uh, uh devi's lab in hyderabad makes three quarters of the world's painkiller uh, the main painkiller globally is naproxen devi's lab makes 75% of the world's naproxen let's talk about another indian company which makes 70% has 70% global market share a chhota sa company outside pune called garware technical fibers they make 70% of the fishing nets used for salmon aquaculture uh, uh setting out of pune uh, this afternoon they are, uh, they make so much cash that this afternoon in the midst of covid they announced a buyback right so so uh, monopolists are there they are great monopolies are being built in our country by bright hard working business people Uh, who don't lose sleep about chart tech disruption chal raha hai malik right who sit there quietly apply their brains think through that process that i described to you who don't sort of rock up in you know uh, uh, cricket stadiums or you know uh, film star parties they just sit there and keep compounding the challenge for everybody on this zoom call is these people don't come on tv or media to give interviews so kya hota hai you guys the people who come and you know talk in the media are not the monopolists they are the ulta right so because you are exposed to the ulta all the time you get completely the wrong signal right so do you see the point right garware technical fibers are doubt any of you uh, have ever come across the promoter's interview the promoter is a is an extremely smart guy he will never come on uh, on media and talk about this monopoly why should he right he's his his joy comes from thinking through business processes in a way nobody else can and 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 thus he goes and creates wealth for himself and his shareholders the fellow who comes in you know talks on tv about technology and disruption and price war that guy or that girl is not the monopolist but that's the person you are exposed to so you end up getting completely the wrong messaging and and obviously uh, uh, the uh, result of that is this perception that technology somehow is a big part of the monopoly enterprise <laughs> thank you sir uh, thank you for that answer um, yeah. the other uh, other question that we have is uh, what personal traits do you observe in person who have created these monopolies i think you partly answered that yeah. in the in the webinar itself but yeah, would you like to add something to that yeah so so um Uh, the the most deeper psychological layer is that is that a uh, uh, mimetic aspect right so the mimetic aspect is central most of us 99.9% of us com- myself completely included right we frame our aspirations our narrative in life by observing everybody else right when how what clothes will i wear i'll observe what are you wearing i'll wear something similar right what music Listen to what book should I read? Right. So from a very early age, because we are social animals, because we are social animals, 
99.9% of us grew up by forming and framing our desires and narrative by observing the world around us the core trait of a monopolist is he or she does not is not like this they could not care less ki manish bansal ya saurabh mukherjee mere bare mein kya sochta hai right main hawai chappal pehan raha hu ya uh, italian jute pehan raha hu right what does saurabh or manish bansal think he does not care right that is very hard that's a mindset which is very hard to cultivate and that's i think the central essence the great talent of a uh, the great sort of character trait the most defining character trait of monopolies is this aspect where they really not that fast what is the consensus thinking the mainstream thinking mukhya dhara mein kya baat chal rahi hai monopolies ko koi usse dilchaspi nahi hai um, now if you guys want sort of more you know more really good stuff on the subject read the outsiders by william thorndike right he's given you detailed profiles of seven great seven great american promoter ceos seven great american promoters or ceos who did this in the 40 years between 1970 and 2010 and thus created seven businesses which outperformed ge by a factor of 20 in the 40 years when ge was the world's largest company right the outsiders by william thorndike and uh, if you want to read about the same construct in the indian context read unusual billionaires by by yours truly By the way, uh, given this, this is India. You can also download the pirated copy if you want, free of charge. A lot of people get a lot of joy from downloading the pirated copy. Under under man, me shanti milti hai ki maine pirated copy download kiya. A lot of people tell me with pride, maine torrent se download free me. Right, I hope not. I hope not. Uh, the third question is, uh, how does monopoly work? Uh, like, how does the second generation of family integrate with professional management? And can you explain uh, with an example of Asian pens or Gurjar to uh, to you know what what role has the family member to play? Right. So so I think uh, uh, obviously in our country we are going through this transition where many of the family owned monopolies are uh, are to a great greater or lesser extent being successful in either uh, professionalizing the 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 management or not. So so I think. the most advanced is the company you mentioned asian paint so from 1969 onwards they have hired the best and brightest people from india's business schools at the age of 22 given them 40 year career progressions and typically every 7 8 years the asian paint scassi suite changes they rarely have rarely seen hire any uh, rarely seen asian paints hire anybody in the c suite from the job market almost always they the the people who were recruited 20 30 years ago rise to the top jobs every 7 8 years their ceo changes the stock market doesn't care because they know the asian paint ceo next one will be just as good as the last one and i think it's the most uh, most professionalized boardroom in terms of sheer quality of succession planning not just the ceo role but cfo head of technology head of hr brilliantly done uh, a company which is trying to pull this off is sap delight over the last 10 11 12 years the parekh family has been making a very serious attempt to professionalize the whole setup the family is pulling back uh, bajaj finance we discussed right great example where rajiv jain runs the shop sanjeev bajaj is the promoter in in the in the this sort of new generation monopoly construct the way the construct is working out for say investors like us is the ceo runs the shop day to day right you know how will we market how will we distribute how you know what is our operating metrics the ceo runs the shop on that front the promoter makes the call on capital allocation that's the split in responsibilities in in the best monopoly shops where the family has figured out uh, uh, the the uh, optimal allocation of responsibility the promoter does not get involved ki boss aaj hamara operating metric kya hoga what are our prices what pay rise will be give our management the promoter's big job the main job if i ask me 99% of the best promoter's job is capital allocation how will we spend our free cash flow where will we allocate will we reinvest will we do a buyback will we give a dividend etc the ceo's job is to drive the is to take the whip and you know flog the flog the company forward uh, drive efficiency out of the system uh, thank you so much for right uh, i really want to be mindful of everybody's time on a friday evening so uh, we have manish Uh, with us, who is the director of uh, and managing director of India Operations of Sunspool. Uh, 
Uh, and he would like to share some of his thoughts on the topic, uh, maybe close in uh, with a few thoughts of his own. So please, Manish, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Shubh. Uh, thank you, Saurabh, for a very, very enlightening evening. Uh, very beautiful. Uh, the construct, the thoughts, the examples. I think I'm, I'm very delighted and very thankful to you, Saurabh, for taking this beautiful time out to share your knowledge, your experience, uh, and your wisdom. You know, let me put it this way, uh, with the entire set of people here. So, you know, two or three points which you mentioned, very interesting that monopolists escape competition. They don't compete, they escape competition. One interesting point you talked about is build a niche and then the build entry barriers around that niche. You know, and monopolists build and the ecosystem around each niche they create. You also talked about seven things to do and seven things not to do and I'm reminded of what, uh, what Steve Jobs said, right? We are very proud of what we do and we are also proud of what we don't. So it's a beautiful thought process which you put together in two slides of what they do, the monopolies do, and what monopolies don't. And, you know, you talked about very interesting points, Saurabh, uh, wherein you said monopolies don't talk about it. And, and I remember having read the book, uh, Peter Thiel, uh, you know, uh, when he says, people who create monopolies businesses, they don't talk about it. And people who talk about it don't create the monopolies businesses. So it's a very interesting thought process. Thank you very, very much. And I sincerely, sincerely appreciate devoting your time here and sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and experience with all of us. Thank you very, very much. And have a beautiful evening. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you so much everyone for joining in this session and uh, I hope you had a wonderful time uh, and you have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you, Manish. Uh, thank you, the audience.